Mario Kart Double Dash. This was another one of those childhood games for me. The big twist for this game is Mario and friends doubling down together and teaming up in twos. It's a phenomenal experience, but enough mindless chatter. Let's get into why Mario Kart Double Dash is mind-blowing. In three, two, one. Nintendo! You can't start a game better than that. These menus are so gorgeous and clean, even for today's standards. This roster is so lit. Koopa and Paratroopa, Diddy Kong, King Boo, and Petey Piranha? Now that's what I'm talking about. New to Mario Kart is the All Cup Tour, where you'll marathon every single track. I can't believe this mode isn't featured in the new installments. The Bowser Shell. I mean, just look at this awesome giant ball of death. I love how there's a cart that's just Yoshi's head, and same with Birdo. There's even a bullet bill cart. This is when Mario Kart started to innovate with cart designs. Does anyone even remotely dislike DK Mountain? Anyone out there? Mm, yeah, that's what I thought. There's not a single bad song to be found. Whether you like the open, chirpy beat from the circuit tracks to the cold and eerie Bowser's Castle, every song is filled to the brim with charm. You know how much I'm obsessed with Block 4, but Pipe Plaza makes a very close second. It's one of the top battle tracks ever created in Mario Kart, and you need to try it if you haven't already. The controls are definitely different compared to the other games, but once you get used to them, they feel fantastic. Also, the drifting mechanics are top-notch, well, outside of Mario Kart DS. It's just so easy to get drifts in. The Chain Chomps. While a bit hectic, careening across the track with your Chain Pal is so much fun even if he accidentally knocks you over in harder tracks. The red shells actually work. Well, not perfectly, but a hell of a lot better than most Mario Kart titles. Wow, a dinosaur course. Wouldn't it be cool if Mario could actually turn into a- Oh my god! And the Yoshi slash Birdo Wake is basically the red shell 2.0. Not only does it travel farther, but it has better accuracy, and it sprays items on the field after impact. Driving around in Daisy's cruise ship is so cool. I love going around the pool, inside the kitchen, and even under the deck. Well, okay, don't don't, don't do that, because it's it's generally slower. Mario Coliseum was the first and still the only track to have two labs because of its sheer length. Driving around an outline of Yoshi makes for a surprisingly solid track. I'm kind of surprised more characters haven't gotten the same treatment. Giant bananas, baby. Bigger really is better when it comes to Double Dash. I really shouldn't enjoy Baby Park as much as I do, but the zany music mashed with the onslaught of Bowser shells, bananas, and other items makes for a hectic race. Riding up the sides of the bridge without falling. Like, seriously, how do you people do that? The co-op is genuinely brilliant because you and a friend can actually ride together in the same cart while being able to switch between driving and throwing items. Wah, Luigi Stadium. It's a Waluigi track, so it objectively can't be bad. When you're starting a race and mash the A button just to see Diddy Kong flip out. I don't know what it is, but I love this Rainbow Road. It's just the right difficulty, the music is wonderful, the colors are vibrant, it's just perfect. Well, okay, the red shells don't really work here, but hey, it's Rainbow Road. For the first time, characters have special items. And no, it's not just the CPU in Super Mario Kart, you get to use them. Mario and Luigi get fireballs, Wario and Waluigi get bombs, and so on and so forth. It's kind of sad that no other Mario Kart game has had this feature, because it makes for some intriguing strategy when picking racers. Unlocking the ceremony cart after getting gold trophies for every cup is the most satisfying thing. You can even use it for all weight classes. I love how some of the tracks are interconnected with one another. Looking into the horizon of Peach Beach and Yoshi Circuit, you can spot Daisy's Cruiser. In Baby Park and Dino Dino Jungle, you can find the volcano from DK Mountain. In Mushroom Bridge, you can find Mushroom City and the castle from Mario Circuit. Plus, the bridge from Mushroom Bridge can be seen in Mushroom City. And what's above Rainbow Road? Good old Mushroom City. Ah, the world of Double Dash. It's so wonderful. These sculptures have carved in heads of Mario and his pals. I love these little touches. If you ever told me that driving on top of the GameCube would be a good idea, I'd say you're out of your mind. Well, you weren't, so congratulations. Uh, Lonely Goomba, add confetti, and children shouting yay. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Did you notice how the mushrooms in the background change to stars when going from green to blue? This UI is seriously godly. There is nothing like good old bob and blast and I know Mario Kart 8 Deluxe has this mode too, but it's just not the same. There's an actual LAN mode where you can hook two or more GameCubes up to play with up to 16 people. I don't know if anyone that's actually tried that, but that's pretty darn sweet. If you play in co-op and both of you get the boost at the beginning, that's called a double dash. 
Roll credits. A Hat in Time is a 3D platformer that came out at a pretty bad time. A few weeks after its release, Mario Odyssey dropped, and that turned a lot of this game's attention away. But I'm telling you, you gotta try this if you haven't already, or if you finished playing Mario Odyssey. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Gears for Breakfast for sending me a copy of this. I really appreciate that. But now, let's get into why A Hat in Time is mind-blowing. In 3, 2, 1... Hat Kid is straight up adorable. Or as Gears for Breakfast would say, heckin' cute. A Hat in Time as a game does its own thing. It looks like a typical 3D platformer, but the way it's structured is really unique. Every mission you encounter is varied and never feels the same. There's no getting a hundred coins in every level or repetitive levels like that. The camera is just about perfect. You'll almost never have any issues with awkward angles. The graphics and colors have a very simple and appealing look to them. If Hat Kid is idle long enough, she grabs stuffed animals and makes them kiss. This game is way too cute. There's a girl with a mustache that fights the Mafia. And she's British. Yeah. Also, Hat Kid beats up the Mafia with just a straight up umbrella. Yeah, yeah, yeah an umbrella. Similarly to Mario 64, Hat Kid has a variety of hats she can use for special moves. One of them lets her run fast, another wields potion concoctions, and another transforms her into an ice sculpture. She can even slow down time with a time stop hat. You can collect hat flares too, so if you want to run fast in a hairband instead of the normal sprint hat, you can. Hat Kid's movement is incredibly crisp and precise. Jumping and walking around feel just right, plus she can wall run and jump, dive, use a grappling hook to swing around, and like we said, smack people with an umbrella. Speak of, the umbrella attack is perfect. Oftentimes, 3D platformers will give characters unnecessary and unused moves to attack enemies, but Hat Kid just has the umbrella, and it feels so satisfying whacking things around. A cool thing about the dive, you can actually cancel it out at any time, which is so important when making jumps in 3D platformers. The polish of these controls compare to Mario Odyssey. Like, I'm not even kidding. The hub world is just the right size, not too small and not too big. Each room is really diverse too in its theming and colors which really helps them stand out. Along your adventure, you'll find these relic figure things. When you get to your ship, you can put the relics together to make things like a hamburger or a box of crayons, which creates time rifts, and that's awesome, you're actually rewarded for exploring. The mission where you go around the train figuring out who committed the murder is one of the best this game has to offer. It's a great combination of platforming and stealth action. And you can make up all these fake names the crows ask you, like, what would your pet's childhood pet be? Uh, Ugandan knuckles. Nah, I probably shouldn't even write that. No one will care about that meme soon. The complicated scientific formula is a goddamn recaptcha. What body part of yours are you most ashamed of? Alright, we all know where this is going. Yeah, my pelvis is chunky, I gotta work on that. Let me spit a fact at you. A group of crows can also be referred to as a murder of crows. For this mission, this group of crows are trying to solve a murder. This game is smart as hell. You ever wanted to play a text adventure-like game from the early 80s? A Hat in Time has you covered. That satisfying snap when you collect a piece of yarn. The time rift sections are so much fun to play through. The atmosphere is just so calming and innocent, and some of them remind me of a lot of the secret stages from Mario Sunshine. Whenever it rains, you don't have to worry about Hat Kid getting all wet because she automatically puts on a poncho. Duh. Each loading screen has beautifully hand-drawn pictures teasing at what's coming up in the next mission. This extra detail wasn't even needed, but makes the game feel even more rich. Even the voice acting is pretty top-notch. I especially love the conversations between the conductor and DJ Grooves. Nonsense, darling. Nonsense. There is places in the game where you can just sit down and take everything in. The music soothes and you can just sit back and relax. You can walk on top of the casino's floorboards and find rats. That's disgustingly accurate for a place like this. All the boss fights are genuinely engaging. They actually throw a decent challenge at you, which is really refreshing. Two pairs of sunglasses is always better than one. Always. I love how you randomly get charged for destroying property while running around the studio. Like, a TPTKO costs $1,500 for some reason. DJ Grooves will only take that picture of you when Hat Kid moves. Trust me, you can stand still till the cows come home, but he's not snapping the pic until you fidget around. And then you get to fix your own picture with some paint tools. How thoughtful of him. 
This is like the happiest level in video game history. You go around this town, get your picture taken by random people, slowly become a diva, and the music is cheery and poppy like, oh my god. Get ready because spoilers are coming. Skip to this time if you don't want to see the final boss. But basically, it, it's so freaking cool, okay? Mustache Girl takes all your time pieces and tries to claim everyone's a bad guy. But you're all like, nope. So she gets mad at you and starts to shoot lasers, teleports really fast, creates unbreakable shields, and all you got is this little umbrella, okay? But with a time stop half, you're actually able to hit her. And then at the end, she gets even more powerful. But all your friends from the game literally sacrifice themselves, giving you infinite health while you continue to fight her to the end. Like, oh my god, it's so good. Play it. Oh. That moment when a hat in time turns into a horror game. Like, seriously. Queen Vanessa creeps the hell out of me, and the unsettling atmosphere doesn't help my nerves. The no bonk badge is the greatest thing. You can just charge at a wall and Hat Kid will run and jump right into it. If you happen to be one of those masochist gamers, the one hit hero badge is just for you. This game proved that Kickstarter projects can be successful. They're not always gonna end up like Mighty number no. 9. It's still crazy to think that a lifelong dream of mine came true. I remember fantasizing as a kid about how cool it'd be to be able to make your own Mario levels, and it's actually a thing now. I know ROM hacks have existed for years, but this is different, okay? So let's get into this. Here is why Super Mario Maker is mind blowing. In 3, 2, 1. So this is basically the only game that works perfectly with the Wii U gamepad. I know this is obvious, but Super Mario Maker is a never-ending Mario game. Just take that in for a second and you'll realize how awesome that really is. You can make your own levels with not just the Mario Bros. 1 style, but also 3, World, and New. Okay, off topic, but calling the modern Mario games new is really starting to make less and less sense. Every style has the same physics from their counterparts, making for different feeling Mario levels, depending on which game style you choose. The amount of customization available is insane. Like, I don't even know where to begin. So there's tons and tons of assets you can use. There's lots of different enemies and blocks with varying textures and interactivity. You can also set up warp pipes and doors to take you to a different section of your level. And don't worry, the dream of putting giant flying Koopa Troopas in question mark blocks is finally fulfilled. You can put pretty much anything in these blocks. It gets crazier though. Adding feathers or a mushroom to the enemies makes them larger and lets them fly. Shaking some enemies will change them too. Like you can change Bowser to Bowser Jr. if you wanted. And you can stack enemies on top of each other. God damn, this game has it all. Nintendo went out of their way to create a ghost and airship backdrop and music for Mario Bros. 1 just so it could fit with the newer games. Whenever you add something to your level, there's a cool little jingle that syncs with the song playing in the background. If you like sound effects, there's plenty to choose from. So when you throw in that troll invisible box, you can also include the laughing sound now. I, I also hate you. There's tons of unlockable characters in the Mario Bros. 1 engine. Some of them can even be scanned in with Amiibo. The selection is really out there too, like there's a Mahjong tile, Dr. Lob from Big Brain Academy, Mr. Saturn from Earthbound, and a bird. I I'm not kidding, a freaking bird. You can even interact with the main menu. Like if you touch the letter K, it turns the whole screen into a sapia tone and is accompanied with an 8-bit variation of the song. It's completely unnecessary, but I love this extra touch. Finally, the Goomba Shoe can appear in more than one level. I'm looking at you, Mario Bros. 3. If you need to make levels with precise jumps, this outline mode can help make that a lot easier, being able to see Mario's full scope in his jump. You can shake the Goomba Shoe into a stiletto, because why not? You know how most Mario games have really easy boss battles? Well, there's tons of ways to make them actually challenging with Super Mario Maker. Go make Bowser giant, push the ceiling down. The limit is your imagination, honestly. When you shake a muncher, some flies pop onto the screen and you're directed to a gnat smacking minigame. Kind of like what Mario Paint had. Also like, what the heck, that's totally random. Remember when Yoshi used to wuss out whenever Mario entered a ghost house in Super Mario World? I guess he's built up some courage in this game. Cause he's, he's in the house right now. Oh, good for him. Good for him. Claps for Yoshi. I always hated that you couldn't go backwards in a level in Mario Bros. 1. Thank god this was fixed in the Mario Maker version. 
The fire flowers are finally colored properly in Mario Bros. 3. Like seriously, they aren't blue or white, Nintendo. Gosh. You can find protective hats that can keep you safe from, say, getting squished by a thwomp. How this hat keeps Mario standing upright after thousands of pounds of force is beyond me, but it works, so whatever. <laughs> for years, Nintendo fans have been asking for a Waluigi game. Well, that kind of already happened, because you can technically play as him in Super Mario Maker. So I guess that counts? When you share levels, people can leave comments on it for hints and reactions. Or, well, they could. Oh. I wouldn't try to erase Mario, he'll start to freak out. Aw, oh, it's okay, I'm just messing around, buddy. While a majority of people's levels are... kind of crappy, there's a few really fantastic and creative ones out there. Thank God you can easily find those in the star ranking category. Heck, you can even follow certain people to keep up with what levels they make. It's too bad they aren't notified about it, but it's still a great feature. There's a ton of levels created by the developers themselves, too, including event courses, which introduce brand new characters like the Squid Sisters or Undo Dog. Plus, you can play the exact same course that was played at the Nintendo World Championships. You can play as a trampoline. Okay. Super Smash Bros. Melee. When you hear the name, your attention is instinctively drawn to how fantastic this game is. And it's for sure my favorite Smash game and will likely always be. But enough chatter, let's get into why Super Smash Bros. Melee is mind-blowing. In 3, 2, 1, Super Smash Bros. Melee! You gotta love how the narrator screams the title of the game. The opening cutscene is still to this day groundbreaking and flawless. It's such a spectacle to see all your favorite Nintendo characters seamlessly move across the screen. It embarrasses Smash 4's opening cutscene. Like, I mean, look at this. They didn't even try. Ugh. Look at how clean the menus look. The color choices and simplicity are exquisitely modern, even to this day. You thought 12 Nintendo characters was cool? Well, Melee's got double that, because there's 26 now. Granted, a couple of the characters are clones, but still. And Smash 64 only had 9 stages. Pfft, lame. It doesn't even compare to Melee's 29 stages. If shaking the menu like an idiot sounds like a good time, well, now you can spam it around and annoy all your friends. Stop! You can finally play as Bowser! I know that's really old news by now, but back then it was like the coolest thing of all time. And his run animation cracks me up too, like what is he even doing? And you can play as Mewtwo. The god of all Pokemon is playable in a fighting game. He's so cool that he doesn't even hold his items, they just kind of levitate from his sheer presence. Or, well okay, it's probably just, you know, psychic powers, but whatever. I love how there's multiple ways to unlock the characters. You can simply do a bunch of versus matches, or you can play through some of the single player. Temple is such a good stage that it was brought back for Smash Bros. Brawl and Smash 4. And that's not the only good stage. We also got Corneria, Princess Peach's Castle, Pokemon Stadium, Battlefield, and everyone's favorite, Final Destination. There's so much creativity from the stages too, like we got Big Blue where you fight on top of cars in the middle of an F-Zero race, then there's Poke Floats where you battle a top giant Pokemon, and Rainbow Cruise pits you on a ship where you'll traverse what's basically Rainbow Ride from Mario 64, and then there's Icicle Mountain where you go up and down and... Okay, Icicle Mountain actually really sucks. It, it, it's bad. I love Dr. Mario's black costume. It makes him look so evil and sinister. You gotta love Luigi's judo chop. Something about Ouija karate chopping is just really satisfying. Judo chop! Melee's item selection has expanded significantly, including a couple of bizarre choices. Like, you can literally just eat food for health. Y yeah, just straight up food. If for whatever reason you have a house party with up to 64 people, there's a new tournament mode that allows you to play with all your pals in one giant tourney, complete with custom rules. You don't mess with Peach, okay? She can whoop you up with a frying pan, a golf club, a tennis racket, and even her booty! Damn. The main reason the Fire Emblem franchise went from rags to riches is because Marth and Roy were put in this game, so all y'all Fire Emblem fanatics should be worshipping Melee. Like, let's just be real. I like how Captain Falcon and Gandorf don't use battering items like a normal human being. No, they just stab forward, be because they're just that special, I guess. Sometimes Wispy Woods shakes out apples that you can use as health or weapons of destruction. 
Okay, so I just noticed that when switching between the Ice Climber costumes, the face changes. I mean, it's not really mind-blowing, but holy crap, I've been staring at this for like five minutes and it's tripping me out, man. Now look at this, Young Link drinks some Lon Lon milk whenever he taunts. See, he's an actual good role model for kids. Learn to drink your milk, and one day, you could be as strong and talented as Link himself. Running on the UFO is like a treadmill for some reason. It's pretty funny watching characters slowly chug across. Tired of normal versus matches? Well, there's plenty of special matches you can play. There's Stamina Mode, Giant, Super Sudden Death, Single Button, which is honestly really stupid, Slow Mo, and plenty more. Race to the finish is such a rush. Getting as far as possible while hitting a door before the time runs out is strangely satisfying. I kind of wish it was a standalone mode. This game has the best version of Break the Targets because each character has their own stage, which is also catered to their moveset. If you enjoyed fighting a giant hand in the first game, Melee gets crazy with the introduction of Crazy Hand. I'm sorry, that was horrible. That was so bad. I feel like I'm in a Star Wars movie. There was no reason to make the credits this much fun. The adventure mode actually feels like an adventure. You start by running through a Mario-themed level, then you run around a dungeon looking for a Triforce, and you'll dash across an F-Zero track, and you have to escape a planet Metroid-style with a ticking timer. Not every level is like this, but it's still pretty awesome. You ever wanted to face off against every character at once? Well, now you can with All-Star Mode, complete with the most peaceful Smash music ever in between fights. So event matches are amazing. It's basically like mini customized missions. Like this one, you win by only throwing Pokeballs. Or how about only using Warp Stars? Yes, please. But you can't forget about Super Mario 128, that event match that confused everybody back in the day because it came off as some strange teaser to the next 3D Mario game, but was actually just Pikmin in disguise. So, yeah. And then there's the ones where you fight on top of trophies, and winning lets you keep the trophy. Oh right, we haven't even talked about those! There's hundreds and hundreds of beautiful trophies to collect, which you can also look at in full detail. Melee introduced a character that's actually pretty badass, Giga Bowser. Like, goddamn, just look at him. The home run contest is more fun than it should be. All you do is beat the hell out of a sandbag, then smack it with a home run bat to see how far it goes. Like, why, why is this so much fun? I don't get it. As if that wasn't enough single-player content, there's also Multi-Man Melee, where you can fight a bunch of wireframes in a variety of different ways. Also, it looks like the male wireframe is modeled after Captain Falcon. Good choice, Nintendo. Good choice. I love that each main single-player mode rewards you with a different trophy for each character. It's a great incentive to do everything in this game. You can beat the coins out of people now with coin mode. Now, it's not blood, but hey, I'll take it. It's pretty cool. I just realized, the guy that owns this room not only has all the best consoles, but he basically has hundreds and hundreds of amiibo. I am so jealous and blown away at the same time. Mario Kart Wii is the best-selling Mario Kart to date, so it's no doubt that it's beloved by many. But I can't talk about this game without the help of a Mario Kart Wii master. Hey guys, it's Troy here, and I'll be joining Nathaniel and talking about why Mario Kart Wii is mind-blowing. In 3, 2, 1... The game's got Funky Kong! Okay, that's good enough. Video's over. Wait, we still have a whole list to go down. Well... Yeah, okay, I guess that's true. Okay, but really, the character roster is amazing. You've got all the classics, lots of baby characters, Dry Bowser, Dry Bones, Rosalina, King Boo, Waluigi, Birdo, and pretty much every good Mario character. This was the first Mario Kart to introduce bikes, which allowed for differentiation between the vehicles. Each cart and bike has different sizes, speeds, and styles of drifting. You can play as yourself using a me. I'm not sure that's a good thing. The voice is obnoxious. <laughs> Uh, it's not that bad. The new Mega Mushroom is really cool. You can grow to a giant proportion and squish over other racers that get in your way. If you thought 8 racers was fun, this game has a whopping 12, and that worked online. Hot mama. Hot mama. Hot mama. The opening cutscene is surprisingly cinematic. There's something special about watching Mario and Luigi levitating on their butts. You get an actual driver's license for your save file. That's actually pretty clever. Daisy and Luigi are confirmed dating. Well, kind of. It seems obvious now. While it was cool seeing Retro Tracks return in Mario Kart DS, they really look like true recreations in Mario Kart Wii. Some of them have added ramps to help fit with Mario Kart Wii better. 
One of the best remakes was from Mario Kart 64's Bowser's Castle. The aesthetics are incredibly clean compared to the original, and there's lots of little touches, like the fire spewing in the air across the rickety bridge, and a ramp added across the jump near the end. You get to drive through a shopping mall. The choices of retro tracks are pretty solid in Mario Kart Wii, with such greats including Waluigi Stadium, DK Mountain, Delfino Square, Bowser's Castle from Mario Kart 64, and many more. Tricking is a lot of fun. Not only is it simple, but you also get a satisfying speed boost when you land. And don't forget the half-pipe tricks, too. In fact, each character in Mario Kart Wii has more trick animations than the franchise's successors. The layout of Toad's Factory is brilliant. There's the stamping section where you can get squashed, the section with all the boxes moving across the conveyor belt, the tractors that block the boost panels, and the overall environment looks like a real factory. The castle in Mario's circuit looks so fantastic. Seeing all the detail on the bricks and glass door and windows is gorgeous, even to this day. DK Summit tries to be the next DK Mountain, but it isn't. But I'll accept the greatness of the giant Mario on a snowboard. Everything about Wario's Goldmine is just magical. That's because the whole track feels like a roller coaster ride from all the steep drops and even the minecarts racing alongside you. That sneaky shortcut through the house in Daisy Cruiser. There's really nothing better than diving down a waterfall into an underwater glass tube with the sight of crystal clear water and giant cheap cheeps in Uganda. Uh. You really should watch where you're going. And of course, there's Maple Tree Way. It's not just a great fall themed track, but it also alludes to us being bug sized so we can drive across giant tree trunks and around huge wigglers. Grumble Volcano is so unique because each lap shows the track falling more and more apart. Let's not forget the infamous Ultra Shortcut. Wait, what? Just circle around the rock on the left and you can finish a race in like 20 seconds. Oh, that's, uh, wow. Moonview Highway is basically Toad's Turnpike on steroids. The cars are crazy fast, the music is popping, and you don't even have to pay for the toll. Bowser's Castle is still the best the series has ever seen because of its insane difficulty. I mean, look at this giant Bowser head breathing huge fireballs down the road. You're forced to drive across the half pipes like holy crap. There's so many controller options. There was the Wii Wheel, Remote and Nunchuck, Classic, and GameCube controller. Sherbet Land doesn't suck anymore. Some of the vehicles are really creative and hilarious. Like you can drive a rubber duck, a dolphin, a blooper, and even the blue falcon. And of course, no playable Captain Falcon. <laughs> Maybe one day. The infamous Bowser Castle 3 Ultra Shortcut from Mario Kart Super Circuit is back. Mario Kart Wii's Bullet Bill is the best version any other game has. Not only does it launch you way ahead of the pack, but it'll even save you from falling off. While the timer in the battle mode is a bit annoying, Coin Runners is a really cool game mode where you have to collect more coins over the other team. It can get really frantic because getting hit makes you lose a bunch of coins. Funky Kong didn't get his own racetrack, but he did get a cool battle stadium. The Skyscraper battle track has been heavily improved thanks to its much larger size. And good lord, Rainbow Road is just insane in Mario Kart Wii. You've got tons of jumps, half pipes, twisted roads, a 90 degree downward slope, a star cannon, and honestly, that's only scratching the surface. I gotta say, I've really been looking forward to this Kirby game. It's one of the first big ones to come out in quite some time. Aw oh, dude, me too. I've been totally stoked as well. Oh, what's up dude? Or dare I say, Aunt Dude? I'm sorry, that was totally uncalled for. But anyway, this video is going to have a lot of spoilers, so you've been warned. Let's get into why Kirby Star Allies is mind blowing. In 3, 2, 1. Hi! Dude, this game is freaking gorgeous. I love that you can run around in each different world map, it is so free and open. Want to make friends with enemies? Just throw a big heart at it and you're good to go. Oh my god, this game is so cute. Honestly, what Kirby game isn't? Let's be real. This hub world is giving me serious vibes of Kirby 64. I love how Kirby can just throw his hand in the air and his friends just do all the work if he doesn't feel like doing it himself. The remixed music is fantastic. It is much more orchestrated than normal and really flows well with the game. You know you're having a good time when a giant ball of Waddle Dees rolls down a mountain. The computer players are actually really smart and do what they're supposed to do. The animations are so crisp, you really notice it when the characters dance around at the end of a level. Some people have complained about the lower frame rate, but it really doesn't make that much of a difference when you're playing. It still runs great. I love how artist Kirby can draw something and it's brought to life. Really reminds me of that Doodlebob episode from Spongebob. Uh, here we go again, with Wispy Woods. Same old boss, yada yada yada. Oh, okay, he flies now. Oh, okay. I just ate a light socket. 
like an actual light socket. This game's got it all. Aww, Kirby kisses his friends to give them hell. Did we say this game was cute yet? I love how the bosses are introduced in sort of a Smash Brothers style. It is a brilliant way to set up the tone for the fights. Uh, King DDD randomly went from Chunky to a Macho Man, and I'm totally okay with this. What the, what the heck? I beat the game already? Well, I think I'm going to want a refund, I'm not going to lie, because that is a very, very short game. Oh. Oh, wait a, wait a minute. I think I got trolled. Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah, I got trolled. I always wanted to be a wizard too. Feels good, man. You gotta love how the spider ability lets you bounce your friends high up in the air for extra height. Bonus points for the web that you create being in the shape of a heart. It's quite strange to have battle sections in a Kirby game, but I really dig it. I had no idea that Kirby and his friends were a part of a band. Uh, link to the album, please? Hell yeah, Kirby's got Ness's PK Thunder powers. The staff ability is so cool. The way Kirby slashes and swings the staff around makes him look like Jackie Chan. This entire escape sequence in general is just pretty awesome. My man Lord Hydenus just straight up throws a three-year-old temper tantrum when things don't go his way. That's how you make a good boss. So the credits surprisingly aren't boring because you compete with your friends to see who can kill the most enemies for points. When you beat the game, you unlock a guest star mode where you get to play as the enemies. Like what? What's great about this mode is it's a fun way to collect more puzzle pieces. And those finished puzzles are references of older Kirby games. Chop Champs is pretty addicting. There is something great about smashing up a tree while avoiding caterpillars and gordos. Even Star Slam Heroes is pretty solid. You charge up your bat and launch an incoming ball light years away. Yeah, that's right, light years, man. That's pretty damn far. The ultimate choice is a really cool boss rush mode where you battle against all the bosses and even get to heal in between bouts. That section reminds me of Smash Bros's All-Star mode, actually. The secret Kirby's Dreamland room is easily the greatest Easter egg that anybody could ask for. Oh yeah, finally I get to gush all about my favorite Mario Kart. This game is so precious to me. I played it so much when I was younger that I actually broke the R button on my DS just from this game. But with that said, let's get into why Mario Kart DS is mind-blowing. In three, two, one. Finally, we have an awesome Mario Kart title that can be played on the go. I don't mean to diss Super Circuit because that's a solid game too, but I think everyone would rather play the DS version over the Game Boy Advance one. This was the first Mario Kart to introduce awesome retro tracks. Of course, Super Circuit had retro tracks as well, since you could unlock all the Super Mario Kart tracks, but the variety here is much better and just more interesting in general. Dry Bones in the Dry Bomber Kart is still my favorite kart and character combination of all time. It just feels so good, like nothing could top it. Can we just talk about how creative the carts are? We have the Poltergust 4000, which is literally a vacuum cleaner car, a giant Rambi rider that references good old Rambi from Donkey Kong Country, an actual tractor, a plane with a creepy smile, a tank, and an excavator. An excavator! What? While the character selection is admittedly small, the inclusion of Rob is completely left field and a great surprise. The overall pacing of this game is so fast. Even getting hit by a banana or a green shell happens in a flash. The action never stops. The track selection is some of the best the series has ever had to date. Luigi's Mansion has you driving through a creepy, dark forest filled with walking trees, bats, and even parts of a mansion. Then there's Delfino Square in which you drive through a recreated town of Delfino Plaza. This place really makes you feel like you're breezing through a town, which is just surreal. Plus, you can smash through boxes, drive through a secret mud shortcut, spot pianos, and at the end, there's a huge bridge where you'll either catch serious air or serious speed. Airship Fortress brings the infamous Mario Bros. 3 levels back to life. You drive through a giant airship avoiding bullet bills, money moles, fire, and clearing huge gaps. I never would have guessed that Peach has such a gorgeous garden. She's even got top security. Like, look at how giant these chain chomps are. Woo! Waluigi Pinball. Do I need to say more? Tick-tock clock. Uh, again, do I need to say more? Most Mario Circuit tracks are pretty forgettable, but the one on the DS is actually really cool. The layout is dynamic, and there's a lot to look at, like Peach's Castle, a giant pipe you can drive through, Goombas on the road, and so on. I know people like Moo Moo Meadows, but I'm a Moo Moo Farm kind of guy. 
and this legendary track was brought back to Mario Kart DS. And same with Choco Mountain. This track has been improved too, since the mountains on the sides aren't nearly as glitchy as they were in Mario Kart 64. The battle mode selection is simply the best. To start, they brought back Pipe Plaza and Block Fort. Like, okay, that in itself is just incredible. These are two of the best Mario Kart tracks of all time in the same game. They've also got Nintendo DS, where you literally drive on top of a giant DS. Now, let's be real, it's a lot better than the GameCube one from Double Dash because it's not teeny tiny and it's not like randomly hectic because there's a billion things flying around and stuff. It's just a lot better. And Twilight House is a blast too. You drive around a giant house that has lots of rooms and there's also a small outside portion that's drivable as well. For the balloon battle, each player now has five balloons in stock, but you have to manually blow the balloons up while not accelerating. This makes battle mode so much more complex because you have to carefully decide if you want to blow up balloons or take a risk and try stealing balloons from others. The music really stands out in Mario Kart DS because it has no repeat soundtracks. Every place you visit has unique music of its own, and as you'd expect, all of them sound fantastic and properly present the racetrack you're on. And we haven't even gotten to the mission mode! Yeah, there's dozens of solo missions where you'll go through a variety of things like collecting coins, driving through gates, hitting money moles with green shells, and fighting bosses! Yeah, you can literally fight or race bosses. Now, why hasn't mission mode returned? Like, this makes Mario Kart DS feel so much more full and alive! Come on, Mario Kart 9. Mission mode. Restarting missions in mission mode takes almost no time. I know this is a small thing to praise, but it makes a big difference if you're stuck on a certain mission and have to keep trying it over and over. If you want to draw a custom emblem for your car, well, now you can. This is another feature that's been pulled from all the newer Mario Kart games. I couldn't tell you why. You can even scroll through every car to see how your smexy emblem looks on each one. Mario Kart DS was the first one to introduce online play. The Wi-Fi connection doesn't work, of course, since it's so old, but back in the day, it was a crazy experience playing against people around the world. This was before online was more mainstream. The drifting is actually amazing. You can easily build one up to grab a mini speed boost and do as many as you want. Now, sure, some people don't like how broken it is, but you can't deny that it makes this Mario Kart one of the best controlling ones to date. The bottom screen is so awesome that you could actually play the entire game just looking at that. That's because it shows where all the characters are and even where all the items are. Playing battle mode with computer players is honestly really nice. Most of the older Mario Kart games won't let you play battle mode unless you have a friend nearby, but for this one, you can run it up anytime you want. The new bullet bill item is so cool. If you're really, really far behind, this guy will actually help you out. And it's a heck of a lot better than getting stars or golden mushrooms, let me tell you that. There's a brand new team mode where you can race in a group with others, and the goal is to get you and your team to all place as high as possible to earn the most points. That OP item box in DK Summit that always gives you triple mushrooms or stars. Huh, I just realized, the walls at the beginning of Bowser's castle kind of look like claws, or his hands. That is trippy as hell. While this version of Rainbow Road isn't that impressive, the loop and corkscrew are pretty damn awesome. While Tartop isn't the greatest battle map ever, it definitely looks delicious. See, this is the correct way to implement coins in Mario Kart. You don't just make them items. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Mario Kart 8. Super Mario Kart, it's super, it's smashing. Guys, it's Super Smash Bros for Wii U. While not the greatest game title ever, this version of Smash is one of the best and most balanced to ever be released. And today, we're gonna talk about why Smash Bros for Wii U is mind-blowing. In three, two, one. Oh my god, they're right, Mega Man! This is by far the most balanced Smash Bros game to date. No character is too overpowered or underpowered. Well, the Bayonetta, but mm, eh. While the menus are admittedly confusing to navigate, the aesthetic is clean and gorgeous. Look at the size of that character roster. Good lord. The character costumes are more varied than ever before. Mario's equipped with his NES Open Tournament golf suit, Bowser Jr. can swap between every Koopa Kid, several characters have male and female counterparts, and there's a golden Captain Falcon. Golden! The third party character selection is incredible. Never in my life would I have imagined a fighting game starring Mario, Sonic, Mega Man, Ryu, Cloud, Pac Man, and Bayonetta all in one game. You can even play as yourself with three different types of Miis. And even cooler, you can pick out custom moves and outfits just for your fitting. 
Speaking of custom moves, every character can unlock their own customs. Well, besides the DLC fighters. The game that started my deadly, <coughs> I mean amazing amiibo collection. I'm still way behind and need to get a lot of these. I need to the rest. I need to get the rest of them. If you like 1v1 serious matches, then you'll love that every stage has an Omega form, so no more being held captive to Final Destination or Battlefield. Or Dreamland. Luigi's Final Smash has been heavily improved. Instead of some random negative art circle thingy, now he utilizes the Poltergust 5000 and sucks up his foes to Kingdom Come. Big Battlefield. Because everything is better when bigger. The C-Stick is now more useful. You can now charge smash attacks by holding the joystick in place. A GameCube adapter was created just for this game. The Smash controller never dies. Gone is the dark, muddy colors of Raw to the bold and vibrant of Smash 4. This game is breathtaking and runs at a crisp 60 frames per second. Finally, the Master Ball makes an appearance as an item, unleashing the most powerful Pokemon. If you're good enough to get through Classic Mode on the hardest difficulties, you'll encounter Master Core, a brand new boss, or even Master Fortress. I love how Mega Man's Final Smash is a better job representing Mega Man as a franchise than Capcom has in years. Yeah, Mega Man 11 is coming, but that's one new game in literally years. Hallelujah! 8 player Smash! It's total chaos, but totally killer for parties. The waifu material in this game. Oh yeah. Even though Dr. Mario is basically a clone of Mario, I'm so glad he doesn't have the flood pack. I've never liked that thing. Inputting classic button combinations with Ryu does special or stronger attacks, just like in Street Fighter. Only Sakurai would pay this much attention to detail. Jungle Hijinx is one of the most unique stages since you fight in the fore and background, just like in Donkey Kong Country Returns. Skyloft is nothing short of incredible. It's a moving stage akin to Delfino Plaza, but you travel all around Link's homeland in Skyward Sword. The soundtrack is incredible, just like it was in Brawl, but now there's even more music to pick from, and you can customize it to your liking once again. Not only does Temple make a triumphant return, but the textures have been updated to make the stage look even better. Zero Suit's final smash went from some dumb transformation to jumping into her ship and shooting players down first person style. Oh my god! Ridley finally made it into Smash Bros! Kind of. Well, uh, uh sort of. Good on you, Bowser, for cutting down the cake and slimming down for Smash 4. Come on, guys, give him a hand, give him a hand. My man. Orbital Gate Assault took an entire year to make. An entire year! It's not the most fun stage to play on, but the dedication is very respectable. I never thought I'd be so terrified of a tree until I met Villager. The fact that Little Mac went from an assist trophy in Brawl to a playable character in Smash 4 gives me hope. Come on, Nintendo. Give us Waluigi. It's pretty cool that every character has their own little slogan in the boxing ring, like the bold beauty, uh, okay, or uh, let's see, scoundrel with a fart of gold. These are amazing. 75M is a horrible stage, obviously, but it's a nice touch that collecting the items adds to the score in the background. Duck Hunt Dog is not just a reference to the NES game Duck Hunt, but also to the NES Zapper, Wild Gunman, and Hogan's Alley. Oh, shirtless shulk. What a goddamn stud. Never have I seen a game with so many controller options. You got the gamepad, Wii Classic slash Pro, Wii U Pro, GameCube, Wiimote and Nunchuck, Wiimote, and the 3DS. Those trailers showing all the new characters were the most hyped things I've seen in my entire life. There's something so satisfying about seeing your trophies inside a trophy box. Trying to complete the picture during the credits is way more fun than it should be. The road and background is much more appealing to look at compared to previous home run contests. While the online isn't perfect, 1v1 matches are usually pretty smooth. It's nice actually being able to play online with friends. Looking at you, Brawl. Mm. Smash 4 is a great co-op game, as a lot of the game modes can be played with a friend, or a lover, or whatever, whoever you- I don't- I don't care, just with whoever else you want. Wrecking Crew, a half-decent, vertically-based stage. I still can't believe a boss Galaga is an actual item in Smash Bros. That is so darn cool. The event match where the Game & Watches can't touch the ship is such a novel idea. And the one where you gotta put everyone to sleep is pretty cool, too. I love this pose of the two Falcons. I mean, look at them. Ooh, they're ready to mate. I'll say it. Diddy Kong Racing is miles better than Mario Kart 64. Yep, raise those virtual pitchforks, but this game just offers so much more, like honestly. So let's get into why Diddy Kong Racing is mind-blowing. In three, two, one. Go! 
you can play as the Dirty Mouth Conker, the classic banjo, a DK Kremlin, and many other animal creatures. There's an actual story in this game. The goal is to fight off Whizpig and save Timber's place, and you're accompanied by a genie elephant. What's not to love here? Also, the genie's voice is amazing. I am the genie of the island. Bored of driving cars? You can also rock out a plane in a hovercraft. And yeah, all three of the vehicles feel very different from one another, making each race feel different and fresh. Heck, there's some tracks where you can play with two or all the vehicles. Good on Rare for adding additional plane zippers to tracks that default as cars. Really awesome touch, guys. The controls are still incredibly solid to this day. This freaking music. Just, yes. So much yes! The courses don't look too great nowadays, but there's a ton of variety. You'll drive through a jungle with dinosaurs, the insides of a volcano, a snowball place, some windmill town, and even a space station. Like seriously, just look at the course design and how diverse it is. The variety is only possible because of the option to use multiple vehicles. While the items aren't quite as crazy as Mario Kart's, collecting the same color balloon in succession upgrades your item and that's nifty. I love that collecting the bananas on the road adds to your overall speed. It brings more strats to the race. The boss races are so cool and actually unique. You'll take on a Triceratops, Walrus, Octopus, and Dragon. The hub world isn't just some empty landscape. There is hidden balloons incentivizing you to explore and see what's out there. I love the exploit where letting go of acceleration before using a boost gives you a giant bout of speed. It may seem broken until you fight Whizpig. Speaking of Whizpig, god damn the music is perfect. It mashes fear, anxiety, and stress all into one package, making for an intense race. While the game offers a mirror mode for more replay value, there's also the Silver Coin Challenge where you'll collect all the silver coins and get first place. If you mess up, restarting a race is so fast, it's a blessing. Some of the courses have hidden keys which allow you to unlock four-player challenge modes. And those modes include bringing eggs or bananas to your base, or knocking bananas out of your foes. While not as fun as Mario Kart 64's battle mode, it's still cool that they have two different battle modes. <laughs> the lighthouse turns into a ship? What? Seriously, what the heck? What? I appreciate that in Adventure 2, the silver coins are put in different spots compared to Adventure 1. I really like that. This is the only game where you unlock a chicken by running over a frog. No, I'm not joking. Remember when games had cheat codes? Yeah, Diddy Kong Racing has a ton of them. You can shrink down all the players, make all the balloons rainbow, get rid of zippers, and so, so much more. Diddy Kong Racing doesn't need a tutorial because it shows you how the game works through gameplay. When you first start, you're faced with a bridge surrounded by a waterfall and a rainbow. It catches your eyes, so you drive towards it, and oh, w what's this? It's a balloon! Wow, look at that, I got one balloon. Huh, what could that be for? Oh, wait a minute, this door has a one on it, and I got one balloon. So, I gotta get the balloons to make progress. And look at that, no dumb tutorial and even I could figure it out. I know these are technically silver balloons, but I like to think of them as disco balls, because disco balls are cool. It's impossible to not smile while listening to Everfrost beat. I love how the walrus is just some old guy with a suit on. So classy. The hovercrafts can ride across lava. Yeah, they're more useful than you'd think. Huh, the trees in Everfrost Peak have lights on them compared to the other trees in the game. These small details have really added up. The neon levels are just so dazzling to look at. I wish more games would go for weird color schemes like this. Ha, uh, 64 is on the spaceport. It, it took me till now to get that reference. <laughs> huh. Unlocking TT is almost impossible, but if you can do it, then congratulations, you can drive as an overpowered clock now. This ain't your average Mario Tennis, oh no. This one serves up quality in aces. Aha, uh -huh, get it? This is basically what Ultra Smash should have been, and boy am I excited to gush about this one. Let's get into why Mario Tennis Aces is mind-blowing. In 3, 2, 1... <laughs> My dog. Sorry, bro. No way. They didn't add Pink Gold Peach. There's no Pink Gold Peach. Waluigi's hairdo is rocking, man. It looks so slick and groovy. And same with Mario. It's nice to see everyone in actual tennis outfits for once. This opening cutscene is freaking awesome. I love that Wario and Waluigi are teaming up as bad guys like in Mario Power Tennis. You see that flaming tennis ball? This game is self-aware that it is lit. I'm sorry, I I'll excuse myself now. There's an actual single player! And look at that detail on the world map! Ooh la la! 
Mario Tennis Aces runs at a crispy smooth 60 FPS. Oh yeah. I mean, seriously, this game is so gorgeous. Like, just look at it. The gameplay has some of the tightest controls ever seen in a Mario Tennis game. On top of the usual shots like top spin, slice, flat, lob, and all those, there's now zone shots, zone speeds, and special shots, which makes the game go from already great to even better thanks to the added depth and complexity. The special shots are kind of like when you would grow big in Ultra Smash but they're way cooler and each character has their own unique version that helps them stand out from one another. So in every way, shape, or form, they're just way better. The special shots kind of remind when you would grow big in Ultra Smash, but now they're actually cool and every character has their own unique version, helps them stand out. It's awesome. Heck, even your racket can break if you don't block a special shot properly. I'm telling you, this game got depth. And even if you don't like all that fancy stuff, the simple down-to-earth tennis is available to you as well. You can play as a chain chomp. A freaking chain chomp! Speaking of the roster, it's the largest we've ever seen in a Mario Tennis game, with more characters on the way. Doing backflips and side flips to hit balls from far away is not only incredibly satisfying, but really useful as well. The tournament mode is a great way to play online to get better, or you can play with comms if your Wi-Fi is kinda poopy. Both work, both fun. And speaking of online, it runs pretty darn smoothly. You can even see the connection of who you're about to play before facing them, and you can drop the game if the connection looks crappy. Some of the courses have way too many hazards, but thankfully you can just disable the hazards in the menu like a freaking boss. The Piranha Plant throws tornadoes? Oh my gosh, what a neat little reference to his boss fight in Mario Sunshine. Yeah, you know the one. Bianco Hill shines 2 and 5? Oh yeah. Hey, it's iRock from Mario 64! Good to see you two again! Look closely at the hands on the billboards at Marina Stadium. Those are the same clapping hands from Super Mario Maker. You gotta love how the crowds now have matching clothes that represent the character they're cheering for. The single player gets really hard near the end, and it's nice that the game doesn't offer a super easy mode or anything like that. You gotta get good or get lost. The final boss music has pieces of Bowser's Road from Super Mario 64 in it. That is what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know everyone badmouths Brawl, but I really don't know why. Did people forget about how great this game actually is? Maybe, maybe not. But regardless, let's get into why Super Smash Bros. Brawl is mind-blowing. In 3, 2, 1... Man, do you remember seeing the trailer for Brawl the very first time? I don't know about you, but it still gives me goosebumps to this very day. The menu is just gorgeous. It bursts with color, it's easy to navigate, and you can even customize which song you want to hear more. Speaking of music, there is so much to pick from. Brawl has one of the best soundtracks in any video game ever. The character roster has nearly doubled since Melee, with new ones like Wario, Pikmin, Wolf, Rob, and so much more. Oh, and did I mention that freaking Sonic the Hedgehog and Solid Snake are in the game too? Yeah, non-Nintendo characters in Smash Bros. are truly a blessing. The Golden Hammer is one of my favorite new items. Its opening presence really gives off a special feeling. I don't know why a soccer ball is an item, but I love it. And man oh man, the good old Cracker Launcher. It's so satisfying aiming those shots and hitting your foes square in the nuts. Ooh yeah. And of course there's the incredible Smash Ball. Breaking the ball gives your characters a finishing move for the fight. The graphical difference is insane. I thought Melee looked pretty good until I saw Brawl was just like, damn! Taking pictures has never been easier. Instead of plugging a controller into the fourth slot of your GameCube and selecting camera mode, now you just pause, adjust your shot, and snap. Plus, you can share pictures with your friends online. Well, when, when, there, when there was online. Uh, yeah, it was cool. Haven't you ever wanted to make your own Smash Bros. stages? I know I have, and Brawl delivers thanks to its extremely robust stage editor with tons of pieces, backdrops, and music to pick from. You can even test your stage as you're building it to see how it works in actual play. Taunting has been one of my favorite things in Smash Bros, and now every character has three different taunts. Hey, there's a Fire Mario costume. Assist trophies are great because they bring in characters that aren't quite grand enough to be full-on fighters, but can still show off their stuff in battle. And of course, you can still collect normal trophies too. Now there's a total of 544. Good freaking lord. The Dragoon item is so fun to use because you have to collect all three pieces in order for it to work. And when you get that, it is so gratifying to launch that Dragoon and nail someone straight in the nuts. Or the face, wherever you hit them. It's, it, it's fun, okay? It's just fun. Ooh, look at that evil Link and evil Toon Link. So edgy. 
The Delfino Plaza stage is just perfect. You not only get to explore most of Sunshine's hub world, but the stage isn't unfun to play on either. Is that Fusion Samus? Now that's what I'm talking about, fan service at its best. The Beam Sword has gotten a serious buff, charging it extends its length to a really wide amount. Samus' final smash is incredibly badass, heck you transform into Zero Suit Samus after the shot, and she has her own custom moveset. Being able to run and shoot with things like the Ray Gun and Super Scope makes them so much more useful, and it just feels natural too. Although Mushroomy Kingdom isn't that great a stage to seriously fight on, the fact that we can brawl in worlds 1-1 and 1-2 from Super Mario Bros. is simply charming. You can even find the hidden question mark block in the stage from the same spot as it was in the original game. Daddy Sakurai, we love you so much. <laughs> Luigi has the best taunt, hands down. Aw, Yoshi's so cute! Oh, hey, a Smash Ball! Let me just grab that and see what do we have. Oh my god, he's a fire-breathing dragon now. I'm not a fan of the second Pokemon Stadium stage, but thankfully they brought back the original in all its glory. Bonsly is one of my favorite Pokemon, considering you can pick him up and chuck him at your foes for massive damage. There is a WarioWare stage where you play micro games while fighting. Yes? Please. If you're a fan of the Snake Codex, you can secretly play one for each character on the Shadow Moses Island stage. Ah, there's a big eyeball walking around here. That's just Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff. Did you know the Ice Climbers are the only characters that don't slip on ice physics? How touching and ironic. PictoChat is one of the most ingenious Smash stages ever. Watching drawings come to life and become the level is so cool. And the entire PictoChat song is made with PictoChat sounds. Like, get out of here, man. Someone, whoever made that, give him, give him an award for being the best, coolest guy ever. Photoshop a trophy of that, Tyler. Do it. Do that now. Make the trophy. Okay, thanks. Event matches are back and better than ever. Now there's a huge set of single player events as well as co-op. Plus there's difficulty options if you're an elite pro gamer or a scrub. <laughs> like me. Just don't tell anyone that. So there's something special about the title Two Troubled Kings. See, it's actually a nod to Melee's first event match, Troubled King. Haha. <laughs> Good one, Sakurai, good one. While there's no extra playable Sonic characters, you can see Tails, Knuckles, and Silver running in the background of Green Hill Zone, so that counts for something, right? Wario is seriously rocking these costumes, with color swaps like WarioWare and Vanilla Wario. I can now live my lifelong dream of farting on people. Thanks, Wario. They brought back the Almighty Temple stage. I feel like it'll be a staple for all future Smash Bros. games. Instead of just some boring lottery machine to get your trophies, now you can play a 2D shooter game called Coin Launcher. It's lit. Remember Giga Bowser from Melee? Yeah, that boss was intense. Well, guess what? Now you can play as him with Bowser's Final Smash. Holy crap! You can add more than four letters to your name! Now you can, you can add five. So that's... It's, it's a little bit better. There are a ton of control options for Brawl, and you can customize them to your liking. If you think you're up to snuff, there's a huge wall of challenges to complete, ranging from clearing All-Star and Very Hard, to defeating five enemies in Cruel Brawl, and things like that. If you've ever wondered where a character originated from, a lot of the original games are playable in Masterpieces. Well, they're just demos, but it's still pretty awesome. On top of trophies, you can collect stickers and CDs. CDs add to your music collection for stages, and stickers are used for the adventure mode. Oh my god, we haven't even touched the subspace emissary. Where do I begin? I guess the best part is the large amount of cutscenes. The story is really gripping and engaging, despite there being almost no dialogue. Just seeing all these characters together just makes you feel all warm inside. Subspace introduces stock with multiple characters, so when you die once, you spawn in the next character. It's so smart, it makes me wish this option could be available with normal matches. I love finding an empty trophy and just chucking it at an enemy and claiming it as mine. It's so great. How does Fox manage to pull that off? Goddamn magician. You can finally swim in Smash Bros, so you don't get completely screwed when launched in water. <laughs> Diddy Kong is my spirit animal. Yes, there's even minecart sections. Brawl has it all. There is a large variety of bosses, all with different styles, some of them including Petey Piranha, Ridley, Rayquaza, and of course the greatest threat, Taboo.
Yep, this was and still is the highlight of Subspace Emissary. I remember when Mario Sunshine first came out as a wee little boy, and people actually didn't like this game that much. Oh, seriously. Most people thought it was too different, and didn't appreciate that until we got 10 million new Super Mario Bros. games. So now the opinion's kind of split, but I think it's aged incredibly well. So now, let's get into why Super Mario Sunshine is mind-blowing in 3, 2, 1. The plot is actually interesting. Mario goes on vacation only to find Isle Delfino was accusing him of spraying ink all over the plaza before he caught there. Like, come on, that's hilarious. These controls are godlike. You gotta love how responsive they are. Infinite diving, now that's what I'm talking about. That secret spin jump you can do to get a ton of extra height. Plus, doing that with Yoshi kind of breaks the whole game. Oh yeah, Yoshi's playable. He only made a tiny cameo in Mario 64, but now you can actually play as him and spit goo it. Guys, I guess it's goo? What even is that stuff? Is it stomach acids or something? Ugh. Ooh, that little swish sound. Oh, it's just so satisfying. Obviously, we gotta talk about the flood pack. Firstly, this isn't just a random abbreviation. It stands for Flash Liquidizer Ultra Dowsing Device, which actually fits with what he is. Then, of course, there's all the nozzles, which have several uses throughout the game. The squirt nozzle lets you run and shoot water, but also get up close and aim carefully at your target. Then the hover nozzle is my favorite. This one just screams, I belong in 3D Mario, because it really does. If you miscalculate a jump, which is, you know, easy to do in a 3D space, you can easily correct it with this nozzle, plus gain a little extra height. And of course, the rocket nozzle is a pleasure. It's really not that practical outside of a few shines here and there, but it's fun to use. And finally, there's the turbo nozzle, which allows Mario to run at the speed of quick, even over water. The flood pack is just so great. If you spray water on the ground and dive, you actually gain traction from that water and slide stupidly fast. It's the little things that Nintendo always gets right. And speak of the water, all hail Miyamoto, it still looks fantastic. The graphics overall have aged really well. I mean, come on, look at that water. You gotta love those pianas. They're just so charming and a fun species to be around. There are some parts in the game where you can literally travel into the ground for hitting coins and stuff. Even Mario's classic underground music kicks in. This song. The fruit in this game looks so delicious. Like, seriously, those bananas look so good. Can I please? Can I have one? Can I have one, Mario, please? No? Okay. I also love how you can still do all of Mario's tricks while holding a fruit, like wall jumping and triple jumping. Most platformers would limit your movement way more. The camera is godlike. Not only is it way smoother than it was in Mario 64, but it allows you to see through walls. I love how you have to make this Chuck you literally throw you through a window to get a shine. Be gone, fuck! Something about this grass is just so mesmerizing to look at. Delfino Plaza really makes every level feel interconnected. You can see places like Rico Harbor and Pinna Park in the background. I normally don't find clone characters that cool, as I'm sure some of you know, but the fact that Shadow Mario is secretly Bowser Jr. actually gives him an identity and gives an interesting dynamic to the game. It's nice that before each shine, there's a little cutscene that points you in the right direction of where to go, but doesn't completely say how to complete the mission. Isn't it crazy how every level in Mario Sunshine is beach theme, yet they all manage to be distinct from one another? That's honestly pretty, dare I say, mind-blowing. This is one of the few Mario games that actually has some challenge. Lazy River, anyone? Gone are the Goombas and say hello to these cute little strolling stews. I don't even know what they are, but they're cute. The bosses are pretty incredible in Mario Sunshine. You have to fight off this robot Bowser while in a roller coaster, play slots with Boo, flip a wiggler with giant sand piles, and even spray down this electric manta ray. And speaking of bosses, this guy teaches kids that you should brush your teeth, or you'll end up like him. You don't want that. I love how this secret level has a Yoshi's Island styled background. Such a nice reference. As much as the red coins fish level sucks, I have to admire how beautiful the landscape is. It looks like we're in frickin' Atlantis, like damn. Yep, some random seed grew a sand castle. Don't question it, enjoy it. There's something really special about running around in Hotel Delfino. It's gotta do with every room having its own style and size, being able to run along the ceiling, and the lobby cleverly using fruit for Yoshi. 
And there's even the casino section too, like, I don't know, it just feels so real and homey. Just like Mario World, Riding Yoshi changes the style of the music to sound beach-like. Something about having to give a chain chop a bath makes me chuckle so much. I really love seeing Piana Village at nighttime. The contrast in colors with the sky in Mario is just really pleasing to see. Look, the cutscenes are honestly horrible, but I think the cheesiness really grows on you. Watching Bowser yell at Mario about disturbing his vacation is something you don't ordinarily get to see. You should appreciate that. Yes, there are a ton of blue coins to collect, but thankfully you can easily see how many you have in each level to help you keep track. This is one of the more unique Bowser fights we've seen. You have to launch yourself in the air and ground pound these tiles to knock him out of his nasty bath. It's honestly kind of cool. I know, it's taken me way too long to make this video. I think it's obvious that this is my favorite game of all time, and in case you were wondering the reasons, here is why Super Mario 64 is mind-blowing. In 3, 2, 1... Hello! Oh, hello Mario! What a kind greeting. Is this or is this not the greatest file select music of all time? Let's be real, it's kind of a miracle this game is still good to this day considering it was the first 3D Mario game. Hell, one of the first 3D games ever. Oh, the backwards long jump. How fun and broken you are. Fish AI. Mario 64 did it before it was cool. While controlling Mario isn't as seamless as, say, Mario Odyssey, this game still created so many staple moves like the wall jump, triple jump, dive, and backflip. Yeah, it's cool that you can shoot a cannon to the top of the castle to see Yoshi, but if you know what you're doing, you can very easily get up by sliding off this mountain in a very specific way. No cannon for me! I won't lie, this game is kind of ugly, but it's still very colorful and vibrant, which is always appealing to look at. Mario Sleep Talking. Oh, I'll never forget that first time running up Bobo on Battlefield's Hill and facing off against King Bobo. It was the most magical thing. What other game before Mario 64 had you jump into paintings to go to the levels? Like, come on, that is still cool. Now, sure, the camera isn't the best, but for most levels, you can adjust it so that it works well enough, which is still an impressive feat for 1996. I've always dreamed of racing giant turtles, haven't you? You know, we sure got lucky that freeing this chain chomp somehow caused him to smash his face into the gate to get the star. What if that didn't happen? Would Mario still be alive today? Mario is secretly a breakdancing god, and you never knew that till right now. They say you should never look into the light, but in Mario 64 you actually want to because you're sent to a secret cap level. This game is chucked full of secrets, like climbing to the top of this pole gets you a 1-up, and that is just one of the many secrets to find. That moment when you travel by Owl, because owls are cool. Jolly Roger Bay music. Ah, it's so peaceful. There's really nothing better than riding around on a Koopa shell, like honestly. While of course the cool cool mountain slide could be completed in like 10 seconds with the proper speed and angle, there is a genuine shortcut included by just sliding through this hidden path in the wall. It's also hilarious that doing this while racing the penguin will get you disqualified. There ain't no time for cheaters. The best love story by far is Mario connecting this snowball to this snowball head to make a snowman. Tyler, can you make a romantic heart picture with these two love bugs? Okay, thanks. Oh, hey, look, it's Peach! Maybe she's through this painting, or... Wait, what the heck? Oh! 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 Oh, boy. Well, that's one way to introduce me to Bowser levels. Also, all the Bowser levels are incredibly fun to play. They don't look too pretty, but the obstacle challenges are nothing short of a blast. And the soundtrack is killer too. It builds the suspense to Bowser perfectly. This is one of those games where I just have fun moving around. I've spent countless hours just doing tricks and wall jumps around the castle. Something about the way Mario 64 plays is so addicting. It's kind of bizarre how the courtyard can have peaceful birds chirping in the back while actual ghosts are just floating around. It's somehow really relaxing. Big Boo's Haunt? That's right guys, this is a big house and you guys know how much I like big houses. Oh yeah. And there's a big house in Rainbow Ride too. Although it's got like nothing in it, but still. 
Lethal Lava Land is such a cool level. You got this giant Bowser puzzle with red coins, two big bully bosses, there's a Koopa shell to ride with on lava, and you can go inside a volcano. And Shifting Sand Land is even cooler. You can go inside this giant pyramid with all sorts of hidden goodies within. Levels inside levels really make Mario 64 feel more immersive. There may be no Yoshi to help on this adventure, but at least Dory lets us use his head. It's kind of mystical playing Wet Dry World and first discovering the city behind the giant cage. It almost feels like an Atlantis type of world. I love how Tiny Huge Island has two different paintings, the small one taking you to the tiny island and the huge one taking you to the huge island respectively. Ground pounding the big Goombas give you a blue coin instead of a yellow coin. That one factor adds an extra layer of depth to the game and how you approach these enemies. Yep, there's just straight up a stage where everything's a clock. Like, that's the most random idea ever and I love it. While this igloo may look teeny tiny, going inside reveals this huge room with tons of ice cubes and enemies. Nintendo really does love their secrets. It was a nice touch to include literal freezing water in Snowman's Land. You actually take damage if you stay in for too long. It does kind of suck that the three main boss fights are all Bowser, but the final one is pretty damn awesome. He got this creepy piano background, Bowser's colors are all strange, and you gotta swing him into three bombs while avoiding fire and the stage collapsing around you. Mario 64 has the best credit music of all time. I just can't get enough of this. It never gets old. The name is definitely a bit strange. Going from Mario Kart Wii to 7 really threw me off at first, but it is the seventh main installment and one of the best Mario Karts to date. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Lost Bits right here oh, on- Oh wait, Tetra Bit Gaming? Uh, this is a mind-blowing video, not a Lost Bits. Oh, I was just- I mean, I'm not against that idea. So you'll join me for a Mario Kart 7 Lost Bits video? You know what? That sounds quite delightful. But first, let's get into why Mario Kart 7 is mind-blowing. In 3, 2, 1... The 3D effect is actually good! I can't show it in this video, but it does work pretty well. After so long, we can finally customize our carts. Being able to swap between different bodies, wheels, and gliders is pretty slick. Ah, oh, that's right! You can glide in this game! It's incredibly seamless and adds a lot of new gameplay elements to Mario Kart. Plus, you can drive through water! I love how the cart even has little transformations added on, too. The controls are so crispy. This is one of the smoothest feeling Mario Kart titles. It's refreshing to not have a Mario Circuit or Luigi Circuit type track to start off. This time, Mario Kart 7 opens with Toad Circuit, featuring giant toad balloons. After not having a bottom screen to look at in Mario Kart Wii, it's nice to once again have it since it makes it so much easier to track where players are, what items they're carrying, and what place they're all in. Coins have finally made a comeback, and I'm honestly glad to see it. Collecting them, of course, boosts your overall speed, and they aren't items! Unlike... <coughs> another game? <coughs> It's so cool how when you're far ahead in first place, some additional drums kick into the beat of the song. It's such a subtle way to reward the player for racing well. The Lucky 7 is a rare but awesome item. You got this giant barrage of items that also work as a shield. It's so cool. I won't lie, the Tanuki Tail looks kind of dumb on a cart, but things like this helps differentiate itself from the other titles. The user interface of the menus is really clean. Everything is presentable, and it's super easy to read. Mario Kart finally introduced tracks that don't loop three times, but are instead just one giant lap. Woohoo Loop and Maka Woohoo are wonderful for that regard, and it's really cool seeing more of this island in general. Those precious, beautiful goats. If anyone ever hurts them, then so help me, I will cry in a corner and never forgive you. Just saying. I can't believe it took Nintendo this long to add the Fire Flower item. It just makes too much sense. They're similar to the fireballs in Mario Kart Double Dash, but they're a lot better seeing as they cover more distance, and there's multiple shots included. This game looks pretty phenomenal for a 3DS title. The graphics are so clean and polished. While I'm not the biggest fan of the character roster, I do have to admire how weird it is. Seeing Honey Queen and Wiggler as playable characters is just so bizarre. Shy Guy Bazaar is such a different type of course. It's almost bizarre. I never thought I'd be racing to an Arabian-themed track, 
but I dig it. Since it is harder to play handheld Mario Kart games with friends, it's a blessing to be able to play Balloon Battle with computer players like in Mario Kart DS. And the battle mode selection is pretty darn awesome. They brought back a few retro tracks like Big Donut and Palm Shore, and also introduced Honey Bee Hive, Sherbet Rink, and Woohoo Town, all really solid battle tracks. There's actually a first person mode. Not gonna lie, it's making me dizzy, but it's so cool! Music Freaking Park. I need not say more, this one's a banger. Rock Rock Mountain is such an intense track. It's kind of like DK Mountain in a way, but much more luscious with all the greens. Plus there's a few really big, gratifying jumps to make. Piranha Plant Slide is not only incredibly intricate, but they also brought back the fast water element from Mario Kart Wii's Koopa Cape. It's such a pretty looking track. Neo Bowser City is basically a modern equivalent to Bowser's Castle, and I didn't realize that until now. I am all about a swooper being modeled into a glider. So Rosalina's Ice World is a bit on the generic side, but the idea of being able to drive in the water or in the ice above is really brilliant, and it utilizes the underwater driving mechanic perfectly. The retro track selection is nothing short of stellar. We got Luigi's Mansion, Koopa Beach, Coconut Mall, Waluigi Pinball, DK Pass, Maple Treeway, Koopa Cape, Dino Dino Jungle, and the list just goes on and on. The ramp over the rock is no longer stupid and pointless. Busting up the glider works like a charm. It feels so weird and so good to be able to drive through the pool in Daisy Cruiser. Online racing is of course back, and as far as Nintendo goes, it's pretty well done. Especially considering you can create your own communities to race with, which I think is awesome. This Mario Kart has one of the coolest rainbow road tracks of all time. You drive on the rings of Saturn, across the moon, through a rainbow-like warp, I mean, it's just so fascinating. And man, the music for this one makes me have some real feels. Hey. The Wii isn't exactly known for the most stellar titles, but it did have a little game called Super Mario Galaxy Baby! Whoa, that sounds like my good old pal Nico BBQ. Yeah, of course it's me, dude. What's going on? I was about to make a Super Mario Galaxy mind-blowing video, but I think I'm gonna have you in this because I know you love this game too. Yeah, sounds good to me. All right, well let's get into why Super Mario Galaxy is mind-blowing. In three, two, one... <laughs> Look at how beautiful that logo is! It just screams confidence and power. This is the game that introduced Rosalina, the guardian of the cosmos. As well as a waifu, like, let's be honest. It always seems to be Mario that takes the next step in revolutionizing 3D platformers, because this game lets you walk on walls and ceilings, and it doesn't suck. The Comet Observatory is like Peach's Castle 2.0. The music is charming, the layout is bright and colorful, and there's lots of ways to get to where you need to go. You can finally play as Lugi in a 3D Mario game. Without a doubt, Mario Galaxy has some of the best Mario music ever. There's Good A Galaxy, the final boss with Bowser, Bowie Base, Gusty Garden, Beach Bowl, and the list goes on and on. Collecting and shooting star bits blend together perfectly with the Wii Remote. And star bits actually have a use compared to how coins worked in the past. When you collect them, you can use them to unlock additional galaxies and levels as you play. There is one motion control attack where shaking lets you jump higher while swinging your arms, and thankfully it's super minor and doesn't impact gameplay at all. Dino Piranha is adorable. I kind of feel bad for having to fight this guy. It's so much fun collecting the music notes since it not only gives you a reward at the end, but there's a tasty beat that goes along with it. The hidden star book is actually really touching and well written. I wish there were cutscenes that went along with this. Lounge stars are way more fun to use than you would think. Watching Mario fly and soar through space is so pure. Even though these giant rocks may look intimidating, you can break them by smacking the red part. Pole stars are another great usage of the Wii Remote. Slinging Mario around them is really cool. I never would have thought that Mario flying around as a bee sticking to walls would be so much fun. The red star brings back flying Mario, and it controls a million times better than the wing cap in Super Mario 64. The comet stars are a nice way to freshen up a level and make it a bit harder, especially with the purple coin stars. Hey, it's the Octoling's granddad! Oh, yeah. Manta Ray surfing is surprisingly responsive and fun with motion controls. I love the background in Flip Switch Galaxy. It's a nice little homage to Super Mario Bros. The first bus makes you climb up a giant robot, Shadow of the Colossus 
style. That's what I'm talking about. His sign actually has a name. He calls himself Gilboard. But then there's his brother Philboard. Man, I never would have thought boards of wood could be a family. Space Junk Galaxy is one of the most relaxing platforming levels I've ever played in my entire life. Nobody likes walking on ice in video games, so that's why Mario can skate like a pretty ballerina. Woohoo! The Bowser fights are some of the best the series has ever seen. The only real word to describe them is epic. Yeah, I know that's kind of corny, but honestly, like, Bowser looks intimidating, the music has opera singers, and you beat him by smacking his butt. Like, come on, that's amazing. I don't know what it is, but there's something really thrilling about climbing up this tall, icy mountain. Even though the galaxies don't have as many stars as Super Mario 64, there is a whopping 42 galaxies to play in the game. Racing Cosmic Mario is always really fun. You get the sense of adrenaline racing someone that has the same abilities as you. This entire Bowser level feels like I'm playing those airship stages from Mario Bros. 3, but in 3D. Mario Galaxy actually makes swimming fun. Not only is it simple and easy to control, but riding around with a turtle shell makes it even smoother, including a nice speed boost. There's kind of a co-op mode where the second player can collect and shoot star bits while also helping with jumps. I'm not sure how a secret undersea cavern contains an obstacle course in the sky, but I'll take it. Why and how is this like the coolest twisty bridge I've ever been on? You can save Luigi with Luigi. Normally I'd be annoyed that Gold Leaf Galaxy is a mirrored version of Honey Hive, but the autumn setting makes up for it. Plus it has different stars like this really interesting Cataquack one. The giant screws in Toy Time Galaxy make the platforming so much more intriguing. The gorgeous framework in this shot. Running around with a star man, annihilating all the Octo guys. Aw yeah. Oh my god, look how adorable the penguins are! As if Super Mario Galaxy didn't spoil us enough. A few years after that, we got Super Mario Galaxy 2. It's kind of like an expansion to the first game, but also offers so much new stuff and refinements that it feels brand new at the same time. So let's get into why Super Mario Galaxy 2 is mind-blowing. In 3, 2, 1... There's seven more galaxies in the first game, which adds to a whopping total of 49 galaxies. Hot damn. Luma speaking shapes. That's adorable. Yoshi makes his triumphant appearance. Now you can eat several fruits and enemies with the ease of aiming your cursor at them. And not only that, but he can consume bulberries to enhance his abilities. The dash pepper lets him run really fast, the blip fruit puffs him up like a balloon and floats, and the bulberry allows him to light up his surroundings. Lubba is my spirit animal. The two player is even better than before. The second cursor can now freeze enemies and pick up items for Mario. It does kind of stink the hub world is smaller, but let's not forget you're on a ship that's the shape of Mario's head. Of Mario's head! And on top of that, it's way easier to get to the galaxies you want since everything is organized in a clean, linear manner. They somehow made Petey Piranha an even cuter boss in the first game! How? The music once again does not disappoint. There's so many great pieces like Sky Station, Fluffy Bluff, Hightail Falls, Cosmic Cove, Tall Trunk, and so much more. I'll never forget that first time playing Throwback Galaxy. Playing a reimagining of Womp's Fortress was nothing short of magical. Being able to use the D-pad to navigate the menus was much more handy than I would have ever thought. Mario Galaxy 2 introduces one of the most broken and fun power-ups of all time, the Cloud Flower. You're granted floatier jumps as well as three cloud platforms to reach farther areas. It's seriously so stupid broken and I love it. And then there's the Rock Mushroom where Mario literally turns into a giant rock. What more do you need? I feel like this piranha plant could be in a metal band as a drummer. He's so edgy. The framework of the shot. You know, I just kind of realized that Yoshi is a savage killing machine. Look at how he grabs this piranha plant. He wraps his tongue around its throat and pulls so hard that his head pops Ooh. off his body. Damn! Rated E for everyone, guys. Rated E for everyone. 
Flip Swap Galaxy is the perfect complement to the spin jump, considering the red and blue tiles flip after each spin. The spin drill lets you rip through the dirt of a planet in mere seconds, and makes for some intriguing puzzles. After beating the final Bowser, instead of playing through the entirety of Galaxy 2 as Luigi, now you go on a hunt to nab green stars. It feels much more fresh than just replaying the game, and you gotta think outside the box for some of these stars because they're well hidden. Normally I'm not a fan of boss rushes, since they generally feel like filler, but this game does that with Mario Galaxy 1, and it's a nice nod to the original game. Flying with a Fluzzard is this game's version of Swimming with the Mana Rays, but it's a lot easier to control. That moment when you drill into a hole that spews water to fill an entire planet. Oh, it feels so accomplishing. The Bowser fights are just as awesome as they were in the first games. You basically fire giant meteors at his big dumb head, and it's so gratifying. Ground pounding this symbol for tons of star bits. This slide level makes me so freaking happy. You gotta love that sweet remix from Mario 64. And if you really like slides, there's another one where you slide the opposite way. There's something so mesmerizing about the dry bone heads eating away at this carpet. You gotta love when Mario games supersize everything. I mean, you get to wall jump off a giant coin like nobody's business. So did anyone else do that one-up trick with these Koopas? Uh, oh, yeah, that's right, everyone did, who am I kidding? Mario is apparently a garden goddess. He can walk on this planet and flowers just grow from his presence. Every time I pop into Sweet Mystery Galaxy, I just get hungry. Yeah, speaking of, where's my cheese it box? I'm not that big a fan of the spring mushroom, but climbing up this tower works because it's a vertically based power up and feels natural. Starshine Galaxy has such Mario Sunshine vibes. But then the Twisty Trials is literally a secret stage from Mario Sunshine. Well, the more the merrier, I guess. The Cosmic Clone Stars are a great way to add intensity to a star you've already done. It forces you to think ahead and just play well. Guiding this bob across the glass is one of the most ingenious ideas I've seen in a platforming game. Whoa, the stage is trippy, man. While Freeze Flame Galaxy was great, Shiverburn really takes that concept to a whole new level by mashing lava and ice in a more complete way. Do you like bowling but actually being the ball? Yep, yeah, that's what I thought pretty damn sick. You can never go wrong with the rainbow theme level. Rolling Coaster is like a beautiful mash of Mario Kart and Super Monkey Ball thrown into one. Yeah, the perfect run is hard as balls and really unfair, but you love it. Nah, don't deny it, you secretly love it. We all got some masochist in us. Ha ha ha. Smash Bros. Ultimate is finally here. This has been one of my most anticipated games of the year, and I'm more than thrilled to talk about how awesome it really is. Also, there's major spoilers in this video, you've been warned. But anyway, let's get into why Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is mind-blowing in 3, 2, 1, GO! Everyone is here! Every goddamn character, Sakurai, you're a madman. Cappy may not be a move for Mario, but the reference is really nice. I love that you can now play as Builder or Wedding Mario. It's nice to see Link get upgraded not just physically with the Breath of the Wild style, but also with his new remote bombs. Ike has a Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn outfit, and they even have slightly different voice clips. The extra details were not necessary, but it shows how much Sakurai cares. I love that Pikachu Libre's a costume. Fox is finally using his trusty R-Wing for a final smash. And all final smashes are fast and straight to the point, which is honestly nice to have some consistency. Ryu will always face his opponent in one-on-one -on -one battles, simply because that's how it was in Street Fighter. Aw oh yeah, Samus can mid-air charge now. There's over 100 stages, not including Final Destination and Battlefield forms. Just think about that. Do you realize how crazy that is? And the remake stages aren't just ported, but have been recreated and look so much better now. There's over 900 music tracks. In fact, there's so much music that there's an option to make playlists of your favorites so you can plug in headphones to listen on the go. D did I buy a game or a music collection? I really dig Zelda's new art style. It pops in comparison to the Twilight Princess look from Brawl and Smash 4. Switching between Pokemon as Pokemon Trainer is so seamless now. Plus, it's nice you aren't punished for playing the same character for too long. Being able to see Limit Gauge at all times is so convenient and just makes sense from a design point of view. And same deal with Robin's Love and Sword and Tomes. Bowser's final smash basically turns into the final boss for Yoshi's Island. An expressive Mr. Game & Watch is something I never thought I needed. Monado arts can be directly selected, making it way easier to swap between which art you want to use. The meme has died. Ridley is officially a character in Smash. 
and same with King K. Rule. This game is all about the fan service, and I love it. Shovel Knight is an assist trophy, and Bomberman is pretty darn cool to have as an assist trophy too. Gone is the dumb barrel final smash. Now DK uses a fury of punches and beats his foes to a pulp. We Fit Trainer went from lifeless to somewhat of a waifu. Mega Man's final smash adds Proto Man and base, because why not just stack on the fan service even more? The Inklings can actually run out of ink just like in Splatoon. The new mechanic makes them really fun to play as. And of course Sakurai threw in the Squid Sisters just so we could jam out the Calamari Ink Nation, because you can never get enough of that song, let's be honest. It's novel that Ditto was in Smash Ultimate, considering that Pokemon was originally supposed to be in Melee. Excessive dodging makes you vulnerable now. Thank you, Sakurai. You've just eliminated all those Smash Wii U players that constantly roll dodge around the stage. Th that includes me. It's ridiculous that GameCube controllers are still being used. I'm so happy I can hook them up. I can use all the previous Smash Bros. Amiibo? Oh hell yeah! I knew buying every single one wasn't a waste. No, I'm serious. I own every Smash Amiibo. Yep. Simon Belmont made it in. Yeah, that's right. The classic NES whipping vampire slayer. You can finally turn off stage hazards. So many older stages feel refreshing to play with this future enabled. Stage morphing is so damn cool. Going from stage to stage is sweet. I feel like I was the only person that wanted stamina battles to have stocks. I can't believe that's actually in the game. Being able to fill a final smash meter is just dropping another L on PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. You can actually save multiple rule sets now. So instead of switching to what you want every time, you can just have multiple to pick from and you can name them whatever you'd like. Squad Strike lets you do 5-on-5 five five or 3-on-3 three three elimination battles while picking more than just one character. This is another future that people have been wanting for several years. Thank god tourney mode is locally based again. The training mode's exclusive stage is such a kind gesture to those that want to play the game seriously and be able to study launch distances when fighting other players. Classic mode is back to the basics, short and simple. And check out this gorgeous picture when selecting a difficulty. This makes my eyeballs very, very happy. Oh, did you not know that this banana was secretly a gun? Well, now you do. You're welcome. If you play the Final Destination theme backwards, it sounds like the main theme. Sakurai is the only guy I know that would make how to play music this epic sounding. I wish brushing my teeth felt this awesome. You can play as a piranha plant. A plant! And Joker from Persona 5 is also on the way. Are you tired of pushing several buttons to quit a match? Well now you can just push one button! I know, big evolution here. Yoshi's Final Smash is a realization from the Melee intro. This is a million times better than turning into some random dragon. Fox's voice isn't stupid anymore. Come at me! It's deep and manly like the old days. They fixed the UFO ground on Foresight. You don't run on it like a maniac anymore. You can now see a timer on how much longer you have to use the Dragoon. It's a nice touch. And when you use the timer item, the background gets all psychedelic, really dramatizing the item and making it feel more powerful. When the game zooms in when you smash attack, you know your opponent is done for, and it feels so satisfying. The Fly Swatter from Mario Paint is an assist trophy. The hammer uses classic music now, and getting hit reveals the same animation from the original Donkey Kong Arcade. I love how Chef Kowalski only exists so Kirby's original Final Smash can still shine on. It may not look like it, but Sonic's Final Smash is much easier to control now. Zelda and Link eating popcorn is the only thing I ever needed. You can actually walk from side to side in the Mario Bros. stage. They managed to make it slightly more playable. Seeing the 3DS exclusive stages in HD is so refreshing. The beginning World of Light cutscene makes my pickle all juicy. Your first fight in the World of Light is with Mario, which perfectly matches up with Mario and Kirby fighting at the beginning of the Subspace Emissary. I'm so glad you can auto-pick spirits, since there's so many it would take ages to find exactly what you want for each fight. Smash Bros Ultimate by far has the best credit segment. You shoot a super scope on steroids like you're playing Galaga. And when you finish classic mode, you get a nice little emblem showing it off. You can be Labo Man. I can die happy. And you can change the sound of your Miis, so I won't sound stupid. While the tips usually aren't that helpful, at least they're organized in a coherent manner this time. I love this part in World of Light where the buildings are Nintendo consoles. Like check out this N64, the GameCube, the Wii, the SNES buttons, there's so many fun references. Ganondorf actually uses this sword as a tax now. 
We've come a long way from Melee. This is his best iteration yet. There's a reason this game is called World of Light. You literally travel around the world at one point. Shovel Knight isn't the only indie representation. Shanta made it in too as a spirit. What, you think World of Light looks big? Well, guess what? There's a dark world. Yeah, that's right. This game pulls a link to the past on you. Ganon is not only a boss, but his weak spot is his tail, just like in Ocarina of Time. The start of Dracula's castle replicates the first screen in Castlevania 1. Even the final boss against Dracula uses the same attacks and he turns into that demon thing. Holy sh**, this is cool. At the end of the game, you get to play as Master Hand. Oh my, Sakurai? Sakurai, you're too good to us. You are too good to us.